You're listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And I gotta tell you, people, my guest today is from Buffalo, which my brother's uh, late wife, my sister-in-law, she was from Amherst, which is near Buffalo. And I know that when people are from Buffalo, people always say, where do you get the best wings? Like me, because I grew up outside Philadelphia, and people, you know... No, I'm from the Philadelphia area. They always say, where do you get a cheesesteak? And after a while, it just gets very annoying. But my guest is a wonderful actor. He's had such a great career. And my guest is William Sadler. How you doing, William? I'm doing very well, Steve. How are you? Good. Now, do you get that question? You're being from Buffalo. To, when, when people hear you from Buffalo, they always say, hey, where do you get wings? Where, where are the best wings? You know, I, I always tell them the Harbor Bar. I think that's the best wings in Buffalo. Or the, um, but, but, uh. But my favorite dish from Buffalo is actually the beef on wick. Um, I used to get that all the time. It's a it's a Kimwick roll, okay. which is like a hard roll with salt and seeds on top, and sliced roast beef inside, and you dip it. It's kind of like a French dip. Uh, excellent, excellent Buffalo dish. It's good to know because you know it's funny. I, I've only been to Buffalo once. It's when I did stand up comedy. I went up and I performed at the Comedy Trap, and I took the train from New York, and they took yeah. me to the, they took me to the Anchor Bar, of course, because everyone says we well, have to go to the Anchor Bar. That's where the wings are it. But they, yeah, they've become famous. They didn't actually have wings when I was a kid. They were in, they were invented. I I forget the story, but I they, I think they were invented at the Anchor Bar, or so they say. But. But no one ate wings when I was a kid. It was not a. Th it was just not a thing, you know. Um, and then when I went away to college, I came back and it was all. The, it was Buffalo was all about the wings. So, <laughs> so yeah. apparently there was chicken shortage. I know um, it's just so funny. That's like when my brother's wife would come down and visit. She said, "Oh, you make the wings like this," and my mom would make them, and like. We never knew what they were, and then it was just, it took, you're right, it took the country by storm. It, it, yeah, and they're great, and I love, I, I, I love them to this day. I, I'm, I'm a sucker for, you know, some spicy hot wings, but, but like I said, growing up, I had never heard of them, ever. Yeah. It just wasn't a thing. Fish sticks? Yeah. yeah. Everyone liked them. Uh, you know, frozen dinners? Yeah. But beef on wick. I, that's now, the book. That's wanna, the book. I, I want to try that now. Yeah, well, it was great. It was great. I'm. I guess it was like a French dip sort of thing, but um, anyway, so, on a Kimmelwick roll. So, so as a kid, when did you start performing? Is it true that you used to play the banjo, or were you musical as a kid, or when did you get this acting bug? I played the banjo. I started playing the banjo when I was, I don't know, ten or. 10 or 11, um, I told my dad I wanted to learn the banjo because I had heard, um, you know, all these folk bands. There were, there were hoot nannies and the folk, there was a big folk boom at the time and the Limelighters and the New Christie Minstrels and all of these people. And they all had these five string banjos and they were banging away. Um, I told my dad I wanted to learn the banjo. He went out and bought me a four string banjo, which you don't play that way at all it's tuned different it's a completely different instrument <laughs> and i started taking lessons and realized you know it's like the four string banjo is what you play if you're in a new orleans uh jazz band you know it's like and uh but i learned it i took you know i took three four years of lessons and i learned it pretty well and then i i used to I used to I used to do stand up around Buffalo as Banjo Bill Sadler. Um, I played the <laughs> I played the banjo and told awful jokes. <laughs> now, what um, songs? What songs? Did you until I dis until I discovered acting, and then I, you know, I when other people do the writing, it was like way better. Um, well, when you when you played the banjo and you told jokes, were were you playing like a full tune and then you'd stop and do a joke, or did you go like and then tell a joke? Um, I did, no, I would sometimes do full tunes, I think, which must have been, must have been really fun for the, for the, for the audience who didn't care for it to begin with. We're sitting there saying, whoa, how many verses are there in this? Um, no, but I, I, I guess I was in a folk band 
and I picked up the guitar and then uh, you had to play a guitar in high school. I started to get, uh, get, I bought, I bought my first electric guitar. Um, and I joined a, we were in a, we formed a, a garage band called the Night Riders, ding, 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 which was a this R-Y, what was it, Night Riders, K, K-N-I-G-H-T-R-Y-D-E-R. So we were, we were so damn cool. And we used to play the dances like sock hops and, we just did covers of everything that the Stones did and anything that had three chords we could do, you know, or like, uh, I remember one of our big hits was 96 tears. Cause I think it has like two chords. <laughs> but we were cute and loud and everybody knew the songs. So, um, Wait, did that? I did that for a while. I was trying to get on stage, you know, I guess. And then I did, a, I, I had a high school English teacher named Dan Larkin who asked me to join, to try out for the senior play. And it was Harvey about the, the six foot invisible rabbit. And I did, I got the role of Elwood and I did that. That was the first play that I did. And it was great fun, but I wasn't, you know, I was still doing the the garage band thing, and um, I had, I think, I had pretty much quit the stand up comedy thing by that time. But then I did in Amherst again. By the way, um, I, jo- I I auditioned for the Amherst Players. They were doing a, a play called "The Subject Was Roses" um, by Frank Gilroy, and it's a Pulitzer Prize winning play. A three-person drama, a father, a mother, and this young boy. It's the play that launched Martin Sheen's career on Broadway. And I got the role of the kid. Um, And the writing was so enlightening. It was so good um, that uh, it was just revelatory. It was just my, my eyes were opened to what was possible on stage that I had never, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't realized before. And that sort of began my, I was a, you know, I, I was from a, he, it, it's a story of a broken, a really dysfunctional family and an abusive father. And, and, uh, you know, he's a, the, the, the kid goes away to the army. And when he comes back, he looks at his mom and dad, and he sees them with clear eyes. And um, my family was going through a divorce at the time. And I was 17, 18, 18. And uh, it was, I, I, I guess I, it was the right play at the right time. It came along and taught me a lot about how humans interact and why. And, uh, and I was, I just fell in love with it. So, so you do that play now? Does that now? Do you have the full time bug? Like you go, I'm I'm going to act. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> no, no, I still, I still, I, I still, did, I never considered it as a career. I thought it was more like therapy. But the um, the director of that play, this guy named Robert Schultz, had gone to Geneseo, about which is about sixty miles east of Buffalo. And uh, he asked me when the play was about finished, he said, what are you, what are you going to, what are you planning to do for college or whatever? And my brother had been accepted at Buff State to be an industrial arts student, to be a shop teacher. And because my grades in the I spent so much time in the garage band. My grades in high school were terrible or pretty mediocre. But I got accepted at Buff State uh, to be to study shop and be a shop teacher. Um, I, I, also, the Vietnam War was raging. And if you went to college, you could get a student deferment for a couple of years. You could you could keep your ass out of Vietnam. Um, 
So I was there. I told him that's what I was going to do. And he said, let me, let me make a phone call for you. And he called the head of the drama department at Geneseo and, and a woman named Alice Austin. And he actually put me in a car and drove me to Geneseo to meet her. And we had dinner and drinks and we saw a show that they did that they had put on. They had a wonderful drama department. And that was, and that was it. <laughs> and then I was like, somebody, you know, he, he said that you, you know, you should, you should look at this, you know, you should do, I don't know if you need, if you should do it for a career, but I think you should explore it. So I, so I did. So and my, and my father was right. My father was, I was told, you know, when he found out I was going <laughs> to, I was going to pursue this acting thing. It was, uh, you know, he very wisely said, you should get something to fall back on. Um, while you're at college, because college back then cost it was like fourteen hundred dollars a semester or something, um, it was uh, you know a lot of money. So I, so I got a teaching certificate at the same time. So I could, so I graduated with uh, uh, two two degrees in theater, one in theater arts and one in uh, speech communications. So I could I could teach. So, so you have that, you have your degree. Acting thing went tits up. Yeah. So, so now, what do you do now when you graduate? Because, you know, you're in Buffalo, which isn't that far from New York City. But I always think a lot of times when people go to school for acting, they teach you the acting, but they never really get taught, like, okay, here's what you do when you get out. You do this. Like, how did you start your career? I mean, it's because you guys don't know. You get out and people get the degree and then they're like, well, wait, wait, I have to get an agent? Why didn't they teach me now that? What, yeah, now what do I do? Well, I did. I did the four years at Geneseo, and I did play after play. I just submerged and did play after play after play, and studied all I could. And then I auditioned for. Um, it was this thing called the University Resident Theater Association, the URTAs, and it was graduate schools that had theater programs would get together and audition actors, and you you got to do, I think, two three minute pieces for them and um i i was cornell university uh, offered me a, a scholarship to go there it, it joined their mfa program and actually studied just just acting for two years um and they paid for everything so i so i did i did that for a couple of years <laughs> and then i went to new york city and started uh, by not knowing anything about the business, because you're you're absolutely right. No one, no one in my education. I mean, there was there was no such thing as a course on how to get an agent or what's a headshot look like or or auditioning. I mean, there could have been an entire course just on how how to comport yourself in auditions, how to do it well, how to get the jobs. You know. Because once you get to New York City, you can't audition um, unless you're in the union <laughs> and one of the unions, and you can't join the union unless you get the job, um, and you can't get an agent unless they can see you in a show, and you can't get a show unless you've got an agent that submits you for the show. So you run into all these, you know. Catch twenty twos. So when I got to New York, I just started doing. I after after Cornell, I went. I did a season at the Florida Studio Theater, and I did. I played Hamlet at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival, and I did a season at Trinity Square Repertory Theater. Um, and then I was cast in the non equity ensemble uh, of uh, Shakespeare in the Park, and Joe Papp directed it. It was uh, Henry V with Meryl Streep, and uh, um, it was a great, it was a phenomenal cast. Um, it was like Johnny Casal and Sam Waterston, and I mean, the, it was just this, you couldn't get these people back together for love or money. But there I was, a little bowl haircut, you know, playing one of the soldiers in the 
Battle of Agincourt. Um, and I started, uh, try, you know, I, I, I started sending out pictures to uh, agents and knocking on agents' doors and saying, you know, I don't know if you saw uh, uh, the Shakespeare in the Park, but I was the third soldier from the left. Um, I was the one with the, with the big spear. Um, and and one and one after another, they would say, you know, well, listen, when you're in something, I can see that you got a role. Let me know. And so I and I was doing uh, the Shakespeare thing. Moved got me to to the East Village, and I got an apartment for 150 bucks that I shared with another actor. And uh, and then I started doing the, all of these non-equity uh, or uh, off-off Broadway shows like one after another after another. And finally, I did one in the basement of St. Clement's Church, um, a Brendan Behan play called The, the Ballet Gone Bean Bequest. And I invited Marilyn Zatmary from the Gage Group to come and see it. And she saw it and came backstage and said, I want to represent you. Uh, uh, can you come to the office Monday? And I didn't know what she meant. By the words, <laughs> represent. I, I, um, I was, uh, I was pretty green, but I ended up with an with an agent. You know, she's she said he's going to work, or I I can get him. You know, I think I can get him work, and she did. And you know, she was my first agent, and and so it began. Yeah, so what was then, what, well, you get the agent, which it's, it's always amazing, you know, you hear about this, and, and people now don't understand. It's not like when you have the internet where you can send a headshot and you can send this. You have to actually go out and hustle and knock on a damn door. But, you know, and you have to, and for your confidence, it must, it must be hard because you're getting rejection, but there's a lot, it's a lot worse getting face-to-face -face rejection than an email <laughs> rejection. So, so you're sitting there, you're, you're finally, you finally get an agent. So when do you yeah. get your first break where you feel that it's a break for you? Not just a gig, but a break for you. Um, I, after, I got, after I got the agent, I did show. I, I continued to do these off-off-Broadway <laughs> things. I did, um, I did a show at the Yale. Re oh, that, oh, that's what she would, she would send me up for regional theater things. I did a thing at, uh, for, I did a play at the Long Wharf. I did a play at the Yale Rep another Shakespeare. Um, I did shows at the public theater, uh, several shows at the public theater. And in fact, and I won an, an Obie award and a, an Obie award for uh, a show, an, a Len Jenkins play that I did. Um, so my, I was sort of cooking along. Um, the break, well, the, the first sort of break happened when I got, um, there was a TV movie about the Great Walendas, and I went up and auditioned for that. <clears throat> and they and played the Germans, uh, and and I got the I got the job, and I went. To, it was first. It was the. Oh, and they said, <laughs> and she called me up and she said they want to pay you a thousand dollars, and I said, and I thought, wow, that's uh, that's amazing. That's absolutely, it was with Lloyd Bridges and Britt Eklund, you know, um, about the tightwire walkers. And, uh, and then she said, that's a week. Every, it's a week, every week. <laughs> and I almost fell off my chair. That was, um, but that was my first, first brush with movie stars and cameras. And I had not done, um, I had not worked for in front of a camera before that. It was all theater. Um, and in fact, after that, I got a, I, I, I did uh, Biloxi Blues. I was cast in Neil Simon's Biloxi Blues, and I did that with Matthew Broderick for a year and a half on Broadway. Now, let me ask you something real quick. What was what was it like for you when you finally got you you got this job that will end this? You're on camera. You've never been in camera. You're used to performing live all the time. You know, you, have, you get your chops up. It's not shoot, cut, shoot, cut. It's like do the whole damn show. 
How did you adjust? And were you scared at first when they said your mark is here or anything like that? It was it was enormously. <laughs> <laughs> I was just a babe in the woods. I didn't know hit your mark um, or why you have to do the same thing. They shoot the master of the scene, you know, like a big wide master, and then they come in and shoot the, the medium shots and the close ups, and you have to do the same thing. If you took your hat off on a certain line, you had to take your hat off on that line every in every iteration of that shot, you know. And there were there were lots of things I didn't, I didn't understand. At one point, uh, Larry Ellican, the director, took me aside. I was shooting a scene with Lloyd Bridges, and Lloyd Bridges. We were on a stairway, and Lloyd Bridges kept he would he'd be listening, and I had all the I think I had all the lines. But he would adjust his position so that he was facing the camera and I was sort of in profile or the back of my head. And Larry, <laughs> and he did it over and over. He was just, this was his 800th piece of film. And my first, and Larry Ellican said, he's eating you alive, kid. <laughs> can't, can't you see what he's doing? He's upstaging you left and right. He's eating you alive. I didn't know. I just, I just didn't know. And in fact, after Biloxi Blues, which was the, sort of the big last thing I did in New York, I did uh, Project X was the first full length feature movie that I did. Um, and it, it, took, it took me a couple of movies to more than a couple of movies to finally understand how what a dance it is with the camera how you you know they're trying to take your photograph you have to give them you have to move with them <laughs> give them your face give them your eyes give, you know um and then it you know and then as i my i got more and more experience in front of the camera it was uh um i began to I began to feel the power of the close-up and the power of of acting in a place where you can all you have to do is think it, and you can scare the shit out of people. You know, all you all you have to do is let the penny drop, and the whole audience says, "Oh crap, he knows." You know, that sort of thing. And on stage requires more energy you know there 1100 people have to see that penny drop um anyway so so you said you know after after biloxi you left new york was that when you were saying i'm going to just concentrate on tv or movies or did you think of staying in new york because you were on broadway i wanted to go i i knew i had a break into movies my my wife marnie um who I met when I, in the East Village in those 11 years of theater in the East Village, um, said, you know, you, you can make money doing this, <laughs> this thing, if you, if you do movies. So I took a job. So, of course, I took a job at the La Jolla Playhouse doing Shakespeare because it was on the West Coast. And I would drive, and every Monday when we had a day off, I would drive up to Los Angeles I had agents that were on both coasts at that time. And I had, the, I tried to get them to set up appointments for me around Los Angeles because it turns out that nobody in Los Angeles cares how many off, off Broadway shows you've done or even Broadway shows. It just doesn't matter. It's, it's all about what movie, what was the last movie you did? You know, you know, um, and little by little, you know, I started beating on those doors and the biggest break, I mean, the, the, the one that kicked the doors open that really, that really did it was the first episode of Tales from the Crypt, the HBO series with the, you know, the Crypt Keeper, oh, yeah, I love that it. guy. <laughs> I did the very first episode of Tales from the Crypt and, um, I went in and auditioned for it. Um, and I, I went in to audition for the cop at the end of the show. Um, who it, it, The story is about an executioner who gets laid off and goes out on his own 
killing people that he thinks deserve it. You know, <laughs> he's like moonlighting as an executioner. Um, and t- until he, he gets caught and then he gets executed. But I asked the, I asked Karen Ray, the, the, the casting woman at the time, um, what's up with the role of Talbot, the lead? And she said, Oh, they want, you know, they want John Malkovich or they want, they need a name. They're going for a name. And I said, Oh, and I left. And I got halfway across the parking lot and she stuck her head out the window and said, Bill, come back. She gave me the sides to, for Talbot, these big monologues, right? These great big monologues right into the camera. She said, come back on Monday and we'll, I'll put you on tape. We'll see what happens. And I came back on Monday and put myself on tape and Walter Hill and Joel Silver and Bob Zemeckis and Dick Donner saw it. And they said, that's the executioner. Um, and so I did it. I did that little half hour thing. I then, uh, one of the writers on Tales from the Crypt was Frank Darabont, who came up to me on the set and said, I'm going to do this movie called Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. Um, and I end, I've ended up doing three movies with him and I did Trespass for Walter Hill. The next thing I did was the villain in Die Hard 2 for Joel Silver. Um, so, but it all kind of launched out of that one, that one project, that one moment. Um, I want to talk to you about a few of those roles because, you know, Shawshank yeah. like Redemption, everybody loves. I mean, it's one of those movies. Everyone remembers it. And Die Hard 2, now, was did you have to audition for that or did they because they knew you they just wrote you in i mean how did that how did you get die hard too they it was pretty much they i think they knew i think they knew that they wanted me for it um i went away and did the hot spot with dennis hopper and while i was filming the hot spot i started getting calls about die hard too and this was after the tales from the crypt thing um and I wasn't, and in fact, I wasn't sure I was going to get back in time to Los Angeles. We were shooting in Texas. I wasn't sure I'd get back in time to, to read for it, but they waited. And I came, when I came back, I, I did one, I had one meeting and it was with Bruce Willis and Rennie Harlan and um, um, Joel Silver, uh, the producer. Rennie Harlan was the director. And that was, and I, I think I read, I forget now whether I read or not. Um, but, but it was, they wanted to see me in person and, uh, and they decided, they, they, they decided I was evil enough to, you know, <laughs> I could, uh, I was just the sort of evil mother that, uh, that they needed. And so that, and so, I got that job. And that was, I mean, the huge breaks. Those were huge breaks. There were no question about it. Um, I spent 11 years or something in New York doing theater for no money, um, which I think developed a lot of my acting chops. Um, so that when I got to the movies, it was, you know, just learn how to do the cameras. Um, yeah. Now, so. when you were in that younger part of your career, you know, you said you played the villain and then you, you played this, you play that. What kind of roles are you getting called for? Cause you're, you know, you're a, you're a light, light skin, light hair guy. You know, I could see them sitting in your, you know, did they say we want this guy as good as a mean villain or a criminal? Or were they saying, well, he'd be a good cop i mean what were you what was your majority of you were going out for when you would get called for auditions when you would see your sides you go oh yeah another villain oh yeah another cop no, no, no. there were a lot of villains hollywood is hollywood is very much like that you can if you're you know also i guess it's the cheekbones and the you know i sort of have these nazi bone structure the light hair the blonde hair and the light skin and so on it's easy to 
Um, it's just easy. It's easy for casting people to say, "Oh, I know. No, he's great at that stuff." That's what was what was hard was comedy. I had done, you know, I had done comedy in in high school. I did comedy in New York. I had been funny in lots of things in New York, including Biloxi Blues. Um, but I, <laughs> but getting Los Angeles to stop seeing me as an evil, um, you know. I used to joke that that I got all these boy meets girl, boy gets girl, boy dismembers girl <laughs> sort of offers, <laughs> and then I got and then uh, and then I same casting woman was doing um, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, and I and I I went for it because um, that was funny. It was a chance to be it was a chance to be funny and and. Um, I've always had this funny streak. I've always had a, uh, you know, I have a funny streak about a foot wide. Um, and, uh, and, and I did this silly Czechoslovakian accent, which I'd picked up in theater back in New York. And, um, and I got that role. So, what so was, then Hollywood didn't, then they didn't know what to do with me. Yeah, it's I was like, going to say, well, what, what was well, it like? What now was- what? What was it like shooting that movie? Because it's just a fun movie. I mean, and it's like thing that I mean, you've come from such drama. You know, like you've had these roles where you're you're a this and that, and then all of a sudden you're like, hey, you're deaf, but hey, you know, it's, it's two stoners. You know what? It, I mean, what was what was the set? Is it did it have the same intensity as you know, like a Green Mile no, or Shawshank? No, or, it, it was a chance to be silly. It was a he. He starts out, what's great is that he starts out being very scary. When you first see death, he's, they've been murdered and they're in hell and they're, and they meet the Grim Reaper and he's this, you know, huge, dark, awful, threatening figure. You must play me. (laughs) You must beat me at the contest. And um, they challenge him. And then in the, when they sit down and actually play the games and he starts losing one, you know, one game, he, can't, he loses a battleship and then electric football and clue. And he starts to, he just dissolves. He becomes this petulant. Uh, he's like a 10 year old, you know, who, who can't, who keeps losing. Um, and he has to go and he has, and, he reluctantly takes them on their journey up to heaven and he gets in trouble with God and he, they make him wear a woman's outfit. And and by the end of the movie, he wants to be part of the band. He just wants to be one of the guys, you know? Um, so he goes, he goes on this really wonderful journey. Um, he's no longer this terrifying creature uh, that, that he starts out as, which I, I think that's the, the genius of the writing. You know, it's like, don't fear the reaper. But I got a chance to be silly and I, and, 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 and that was priceless. Well, when, when you leave, when you leave the set being silly, okay, it has to be, you know, people don't understand if you have a day of work, if you're, you know, a singer and you're an accountant, you leave the set feeling two different ways. When you're leaving a set from playing heavy roles and then you're just playing this fun role, is it like... Did it still come with you? Because I'm sure when you play a very serious role, it's still in your head all the time. When oh, you offset, but when yeah. it's comedy, it's probably easier to drop because it's just you're just having fun like a kid. Yeah, yeah. You, well, you, you, I, I, you do take on the characteristics of the character, or I do. You, you sort of bring some of it home, especially the heavy ones that you know you have to sink yourself into it's easy to it's easy to walk around in those shoes long after you've left the set um but um <laughs> but the grim but the grim reaper got so it, it was it was just fun it was like you, you know i was coming up with uh, uh, um we were shooting in the in the hardware store to put together the good robot bill and ted's and and I had the, I, I had this idea that what if what if the reaper um, saw came up to a guy who was smoking a cigarette 
And just as he walks by, just say, see you real soon. <laughs> and the guy goes, sit out, right? And I told the director, uh, Peter Hewitt, and he said, he loved it. And he said, bring the camera over here. And he's the, he's the guy who's smoking in the movie. It's in the movie. Um, it's, uh, it was that kind of, it was that kind of thing. I was like, I couldn't turn my, my silly brain off. Um, everything was possibly funny. <laughs> um, they, they started talking about, well, anyway, anyway, it was that, it, it was really, it was really nice to be able to exercise that, that, you know, the part of me that makes people laugh. Now, Shawshank Redemption, as I said earlier, is a movie that everyone... I did it in Shawshank. I was funny in Shawshank. Well, with Shawshank, how did that come about? How did... And, of course, you know, it's funny because we do it when you say Dumas, dumbass, and then you pick up the turd. But um, how did... How did right. that did, right. did Dora Bond... He's as, dumb as, he's as dumb as you can possibly get. He's like... And it was... And that was, a, that was kind of a choice. Some of that is in the writing. Um but I made him, um, I like to, I like to think of that. I have a sort of a dial. I can dial in the person's IQ and with, and with, and with Haywood, just dial it way, way, way down. And then he can't see it. What happens is they, people with a low IQ can't see anything, but what's right in front of them. They're, so they're constantly surprised by things. Um, and and I had fun with I had fun with Haywood um, that way, you know. He was another sort of a funny mix of a dangerous, a dangerous, uh, you know, potentially dangerous human um, who you you end up liking him uh, toward the end because because uh, he's not such a bright, you know. It's not the sharpest tool on the workbench. Now, when you read that script, did you know the material was golden? Did you know it was, I mean, as an actor, because you've been in plays and you've said, you know, you've, when you were younger, when you did that play in, uh, when you were 17, the, the material yeah. was so good. When you read this script, did you sit there and go, okay, man, this, this is just, this is going to be a classic because it is. I knew I knew it was a strong story. I knew it was a good. I knew it was a good story. I did, I, I had no idea. Um, I didn't know what. First of all, Frank Darabont he gave me the the book, not the script. He gave me the the novella um, that Stephen King had written and said, "I'm going to make a movie of this, and I'd like you to be in it." And and. I think he. I think he wanted me to look at the role of Red uh, at first, but but the process of um, the, the I, I I don't think any of us knew when we were even when we were filming it, um, which as you know is like in bits in bits and pieces. It's you know it's a scene and then you chop up the scene and you do you do it in tiny little you know, tiny little segments. Um, and it's assembled later. I don't think any of us knew that it was going to be as, uh, you know, this sort of cultural touchstone that it became over the years that the message, um, I mean, when, when we knew, we knew it was a good script and then later we knew it was a good movie. Although, it opened in the movie theaters and closed in about two weeks. It made no money at the movie theaters, um, which was not encouraging. And then it was sudden, and then it was up for like six Academy Awards, including Best Picture. And when that happened, they brought it back and put it in the movie theaters again. Um, and you know, I think people really discovered it on video after. Uh, you know, in the years after that, and it sort of grew and grew and grew. Um, not very many people <laughs> saw it when it first came out in the movie theaters. Um, no, but no, I don't. But no, I don't think any of us knew. 
Now, now, when you're in a part of a movie like that, you know, We're and then it gets nominated for o- it gets nominated for Oscars. What does that do for your career? I mean, do you sit there and you go, okay, I'm in an Oscar nominated movie. Do you want to stay in movies, or are you looking for TV? What were you trying to do? Because I know you ended up on uh, eventually ended up on uh, Deep Space Nine for three episodes, which uh, Star Trek fans are they they they, they know everything. I mean, Star Trek they know everything you do. Uh, what what was what does that do to your career when you're in a movie with Academy Award nominations? I don't think it. I guess I guess you get a bit of you get a little more cred, a little more street cred. Um, it's maybe easier for your agent to get you submitted for things for projects. Um, but again, people, you're still auditioning. You know, they they saw you and they saw you play. Haywood, you know, they still go by what they saw you do. So they saw these, you know, the, I, I heard, I think it was uh, Robert Duvall one time. They said, what's it, how did it change your career to, to win an Academy Award, to win an Academy Award? And he said, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you get better seats in restaurants. Um, <laughs> it's like it didn't, it it didn't sound to me like it had changed his entire life. Um, I guess people treat you with a little more deference, but, um, and maybe, and you know, and maybe they trust that you, they trust you with bigger and better roles. Um, I haven't won an Academy Award. Um, I'm just a, I'm just a working actor. Well, you, you you had you know you didn't you, you had the series Roswell, okay. Now, for you as an actor, you know movies, TV, recurring. What's it like to be on a show you know that ran for sixty one episodes? For you, was it? Is it? Did you lose some of? You're going to the same place to work every day, and you know if it's a hit, you're going to pick up for another season. And for an actor to spend in so many different roles and playing this, is it? Was did you acclimate to it very easily? Was it a was it a relaxation for you, or do you feel like you may have lost some of your acting chops because you were always playing the same role? I don't think. No, I actually I I liked it. I liked finally being knowing what I was going to do next week. Um, it's, it's a bit, it's a little nerve wracking to go from one movie to another to, you know, you'll work, you'll do a week, a week on something in February and then not work again until August, you know, um, and you're trying to pay rent and you've got a, uh, you know, a kid in school and, um, it's, it gets, it's hairy, you know, it really is. And you don't want to take any other jobs. You want to be available to do this thing. And you're auditioning like crazy for, you know, there's a, there's an awful lot of auditioning going on and you're not getting, you know, I, I don't know what my batting average was, but you know, nobody gets everything they audition for, but you, but so when Roswell came along, it was, you know, it's picked up for a season. You know what you're going to be doing for the next, you know, so many months. And the money's good. The money's television, you know, series regular money. Um, it's, you s- start socking some of it away, you know. You, you can breathe for a minute. And I also thought, I like the writing. I like the sci-fi elements. And I like the... F- it felt. It always felt to me like it was like I'm reading a novel about this character, and I get every time you'd get a script, it was like you got to the next chapter of this guy's life. Um, and like, oh, he's <laughs> you know now he's gone down this rabbit hole. Now he's got. Now he has a girlfriend. How's that going to work out? And then so it's sort of like his story is unfolding. Um, as their story is unfolding, um, which I which I I also found challenging and interesting, you know. So it wasn't it wasn't always the same. It was the same character, but you know, at the beginning, he's like he's the thing that the kids are most afraid of. He's the thing that the aliens have to worry about. 
At the end of the first season, his son is shot and they saved his son's life. And now everything he thought about them is true. They are the aliens. But now he's the God, now he's going to protect them. And he spends the entire second year putting his career on the line, trying to keep them safe from all these other people that want to, you know, expose them. And it was sort of that kind of thing. I, I enjoyed it. I had, I had fun with that series. And I, every time I got up in front of the camera, I, um, I have a philosophy. I'm, it's, I always feel like I'm getting up to bat. And it doesn't matter whether the writing is, you know, the best writing you've ever read or the worst. You um, don't waste that opportunity. You know, you're only going to get so many of these at bats. So, you know, take it, take it seriously. Do it, you know, swing for the fences. So, so when that series ended, you know, where, where was your mind frame? Because you're, you're right. But as again, you said, you liked knowing that you were going to get a paycheck all this time. And now it's yeah. going back to auditioning or getting <laughs> offers. I mean, how do you, yeah. how, what kept you positive during this? Just the love of the craft or what keep, what has kept you focused? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that. I was sad when it ended. I wanted, I could have done more. I think a lot of the kids on the, on the show were anxious to start their movie careers, get out and do something serious, do something big. And I had already, I had already been in that marketplace for a while. You know, I, I was enjoying something steady, you know, where I could come in. I, someone's paying me to do my craft every single week every single week and the challenge keeps changing but the craft doesn't you know you can get better at this you can you know you can elevate some of this um so i was sad to see it go but um you know i i i, I forget what i did after roswell i think i moved back to new york i decided uh, maybe i could do this from uh, from my little farmhouse in upstate New York, and it turns out I can see that. Yeah, so so you're, you know, I, it's just so funny. So they, now I audition on tape when I have to audition. I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you about that because I, I, I want to talk to you about Hawaii Five O, but I want to talk to you about the auditioning on tape because so many actors love the room, and you're someone who's coming from stage, but now you've been in front of cameras for so long and had such a successful career. When you have to put something on tape, do you do you prefer that, or do you, do you prefer the old school when you got to go into the room and really sell it to people in front of you? I liked going into the room. I enjoy. I I've gotten I've gotten jobs from self tapes, um, but you get a chance to walk into the room and meet the director and meet the producers and. They get a sense of who you are. They get a sense of the whole person. You talk for a minute, you know, and then you do, you know, you read a bit. And then usually they'll say, you know, could you try that again and, you know, make him, you know, try it a little bit this way or try it a little bit that way. They just want to see if you're, if they can work with you. If, uh, you know, are you a dick? <laughs> are you so, are you so rigid and crazy that they're, that, you know, there's no way they're going to be able to work with you. And you get, it, the face-to-face -face thing was, um, it's nerve-wracking. <laughs> there's, there's no question about it. You're just like, <sighs> but, um, but they're like little live, you know, they're little, they're little live performances and they, and they can be magical. Um, things go well. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of, uh, on the other hand, you can, if you're self-taping, you can sit there and say, you know, ah, I, I need to do it again. Let's, let's go again. Um, and you 
you know, do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again and then sit there and watch them all and go, uh, whoever said you could act? Look at this crap. Um, you'll find, you know, you'll find the one, the least bad one and, uh, and send that off to your agent. <laughs> now, now, you, now, you know, as actors... But you get, but that's, that's the advantage is that you can do it, you know, you spend the whole day fussing around with a little three minute scene, you know, now you can't do, you can't do that in the room. You have to walk in, say hello and nail it. That's all. You yeah. just nail it. So, <laughs> and they, you, you want the whole room sitting there going, holy shit, he's good. God damn. Now, did you have to audition for Hawaii Five-0 or was that an offer? And how great was it to get to go to Hawaii to shoot? It was fun. I like Hawaii. Was I auditioned for that. I read for that um, role with Peter Lenkov. Um yeah, and I, um, yeah, I enjoyed that role too. But that was a recurring role. Like you, you sort of helicopter in and do an episode, and then, you know, the end toward the end of the season, maybe he drops in again for one scene or two scenes. And, um, it's not as it's not as much fun as as being a regular. There's a downside to being a regular, of course. You know when you. Put the you know you're playing the same character year season after season year after year. It can get old and it can feel stale. But um, I don't know. I man I managed with Roswell to to find things to keep me interested and challenged. Um, and I and I like this somehow having the security of knowing you know. <laughs> You don't have to go back. I used to. I used to think about auditioning. It was like, or or going from one movie to another. You, it's sort of like swinging through the jungle on a vine. When you're working on a movie, you've got a vine in your hands and you're swinging along. And you come to the end of the movie shoot, and you have to let go of that vine. And now you're just sailing through the air, hoping that there's another vine before you hit the ground. And uh, it's. Uh, it's 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 nerve wracking, you know. The, there are there are long dry stretches and self doubt and lots of you hear no uh, a lot, and it's easy to get angry and resentful, and that's not that's not useful at all, um, you know. Well, you know, you you go through dry spells, but as you see, you've worked a lot. Now, the, yeah. on the sequel to Bill and Ted. I mean, they've been talking about that forever. Like, did finally, did finally, did you just get a call and they said it's on? And what was it like going onto the set? Because everyone's gotten older; they're in different places. You know, Keanu Reeves is John Wick know. now. You know, I mean, what was it? What was that like when you got the call? Were you like, excited because you said this is going to be some good fun? And then, what was the set like? I love, I I love that character. I have such a. I have such a big soft spot for that character and putting on, I put on the six inch boots and the ball cap and the three hours of makeup and the robes and the Czechoslovakian accent again. And it was like, it was like you pulled a cork out of a bottle and, and the Reaper came spewing all out again. Um, that was, that was really, it was really fun. And I, I was concerned when we, when, before we started, you know, how different is this going to feel? Um, you know, is it going to have the same kind of fun magic that Bogus Journey did? And, but what happened, you know, especially with Keanu going off and becoming like the megastar that he is, and Alex is making these incredible documentaries, and he's, you know, we've all gone off in our own directions. But when we got back together on the set, it was like we had never left. It was, it was literally like we had never left. It was, we were just as goofy. Um, there was just as much love and, and energy and, and goofiness um, as there had always been, you know. It, it's, it's a hard thing to describe. But, it, but, I mean, we're fortunate that that was the case, you know. 
No, uh, I think it's I think it's a good movie too. I'm sorry it took thirty years to, you know, for Ed, 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 for the Ed Solomon and Ed and Sick Chris to, to. I mean, we had the we had the same writers, we had the same actors, you know, new director, but but there was but there was an awful lot of the same energy, you know, the so, same sort of crazy. So, so you've done all these movies, you've done. You know, done stage, and then now you recently were in one our, our cartoon president. How did the voice role come up for you? I mean, <laughs> and how did that role come? Up? It's just, it's just so, it's just funny when you sit there and go, "Wait a second, You look at your IMDb and go, "Wait a second, He was Mitch McConnell. I mean, it's just, how did that I all was, come up? I was Mitch McConnell. Like, Mitch McConnell was, was is that president of the Senate, I believe. Um, I don't know. I there was a, um. I got this, uh, my agent heard they were doing it and they're doing it in New York City at Stephen Colbert's office at the time that we're, we, you know, and uh, I put myself on, t I've done funny voices my whole life. I mean, fun, funny voices, that's funny voices and, you know, impersonations is that, that, that's like going right back to high school. Um, so I did, I think my first one was, oh, I did Jeff Sessions. That's what it was. And I was, I was cast as Jeff Sessions and Jeff Sessions. And I just made him like that kind of, <laughs> you know, I don't know why people think that I'm a racist because, you know, when I see people of color, I'll say to them, you know, I think you're doing a fine job on my lawn and thank you so much, you know, and he's just like, just as sweet as can be. And I was like, you just like flip on these characters. And uh, Stephen Colbert asked me one day, he says, why are you, why are you doing this? Because <laughs> I guess, you know, well, you've done movies and you've done all this stuff. Why do you want to do a voice on it? And I said, I, I sort of feel it's my civic duty to poke fun at these folks. So, so that's why I did it. It was, it was, it was just fun, and they were silly, and they're great people doing it. So, so, what what's in your future? What do you have coming up? I have, well, I'm shooting Salem's Lot right now, another Stephen King um, movie. In fact, I leave. I have to go back to Los, back to uh, Massachusetts Wednesday to shoot Thursday. Um, so there's that. And I have a movie, I have a movie, a little independent movie called A Stage of Twilight. Um, and I, I think the title will stay the same. I don't, I don't know, but it's right now it's called A Stage of Twilight with Karen Allen and myself. And it's, it was this unexpected thing that happened. They caught, they, they offered me this role and it's the role of, he's her husband they've been married for like 42 years like I have um, and he gets a bad diagnosis and it's the two of them fighting and finding the, the grace um, a graceful way through all of this and I, I I've never done anything I'm I'm uh, I'm a little bit afraid to watch it because I I got carried away with this character. I I so completely submerged in this character of Barry and Karen Allen is such a delight uh to work with. Um and it's not like anything I've ever done before. It's like, you know, I don't kill anyone. I don't I'm not chased by vampires or zombies or you know, it's not sci-fi. It's two people who love each other wrestling with a problem uh, in their lives. And uh, and I think it's I think it might be extraordinary. Um, I hope <laughs> I hope it's extraordinary. <laughs> anyway, it felt it felt extraordinary to me. It came from a it came from a place that I've never seen myself go as an actor ever on film it 
it was it was it was just one of those things you'd finish the scene and there'd just be silence on the set everybody was like oh my god that was um so it's unlike anything i've done before and i hope it's uh, i hope it's a wonderful movie you can't you can't quite tell but but the filming of it was extraordinary um working with her and uh, Karen Schwab the the writer director little independent movie it'll come to it's going to be at you know festivals i'm i'm sure very shortly but fingers crossed for that one well i look forward to it you know and i, I want to thank you for uh for coming on today it was great talking to you as i said you've had a um you've had a great career and i always love talking to actors cuz people don't know so many people that have never been in a business always sit there and go Oh yeah, they're they're working all the time, but no one knows how many no's go through, and you know you get the no's and you have the ups and downs, and it's just great when I see people who have been in the honing their craft for so long successfully and just sticking with it. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Now, I appreciate it. Now, now do you, I think you're on Twitter, right? I am on Twitter. Uh, Wom, it's W M underscore Sadler. Wom underscore Sadler. <laughs> So people, um, people, go follow Womb Sandler on uh, Twitter. Sandler, S A D L. Sadly, right? Go follow uh, William, and uh, also go to IMDb. Just look at his whole career and go watch the stuff. And if you haven't seen Sawshank Redemption, you got an issue. You got a problem because I don't know one person who hasn't seen it. I mean, I'm over fifty. Yeah, I don't wanna, if you haven't seen that, I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, no. exactly. So people. Go check them out. Go check out uh, William Sather. <laughs> Go to my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 880 episodes. Uh, email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. Twitter, I'm at coopertalk1. Instagram, I'm at Twitter, I'm at coopertalk. Instagram, I'm at coopertalk1. And uh, that's about it. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guests. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you.